Good afternoon, uh, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. I'm Annie O'Gara of Stop the JNF campaign, and our guest today is Halil Alamoor of the NACAB. And as usual with these um, webinars, would you please put your questions into the question box and keep the chat respectful and and relevant and i'm very happy to say that jimmy is helping us with all the technicalities and before i introduce halil um, i'd like to make a link between this webinar and the last one that we had um, the last one as you may remember featured richard falk and richard spoke about israeli apartheid a subject on which he and his colleague victoria tilly wrote very influentially in 2017, producing an analysis that every single Palestinian already knew full well that apartheid was the defining organizing principle of their existence and that the Israeli apartheid regime applies from the river to the sea, including the Nakab that we're going to hear about today from Khalil. And today Khalil will describe to us the experiences of his himself and his people, the Bedouin, who are citizens of the state of Israel, but in the eyes of the state seem to be second class citizens as the nation state law spelled out. So please, as you listen, slot Khalil's information into that apartheid framework that we heard about last time. And I think you'll find that every piece of information that he gives us fits very snugly within that definition and of course for us in the stop the jnf campaign the jnf uk has as its priority its development work in the nakab aligning its priorities as the jnf always does does with the zionist goals of the state of israel and of course, a key plank of our argument that the JNF UK is not fit to be a charity is that it operates within an apartheid context happily and without problem to the overwhelming benefit of the supremacist section of the population and to the detriment of Halil and his people, the Bedouin. So Halil, a very, very warm welcome uh, to you. And it's great to see you and speak to you again. And for those of you who don't know Halil, he lives in Alcira in the Nakab. He's a mathematician. He's also a lawyer. Um, he works in the Coexistence Forum in the Nakab Negev. And he also supports and works with that formidable champion of people's rights, Adullah. And not only that, he's represented the Bedouin at the United Nations, the EU, and here in the UK, where I believe he's met some of our parliamentarians. So Khalil is going to share his presentation with us, and then we'll develop some points and the floor will be open for questions. So just to repeat, please put your questions into the question box. And now I'll hand over to you, Khalil, and ask you to start your presentation. Thank you, Anne, for the, the very beautiful presentation. And I am really uh, honored and happy to be with you uh, this evening. Um, I'm, uh, I'm apologizing that it will be uh, very quick and we will skip some of our slides here. But uh, I think it will be uh, fine because we uh, went to, uh, to, to, to stand on the, on, the, on the target, which is to be on time and have ta enough time for our uh, guests to ask their questions. So we will start uh, our presentation. And here I will share my uh, screen, share screen. So uh, the, the, this is a general view of uh, uh, our village, Asera. You can see it in the background and and here is the Nakab, is uh, all the Nakab. You can see uh, the circled area here around. It is the Nakab, the Negev in Hebrew. It is the largest part of, uh, of the country here. It's about two thirds of the, of the state land today. 
about uh, three, 13 million donums, we say donums here, which is uh, uh, about uh, 3 million acres. It's a huge area. And only 10% of the people live in this area. Uh, Bedouins and the Jews and uh, all the Israelis who live in the Negev is about 10%, not more. Uh, <clears throat> most of the Bedouin who lived in Anakab till 1948 were expelled, unfortunately, to the neighboring Arab countries like Jordan in the east here and the Egypt, Gaza, uh, uh, Egypt and Sinai in the western side and even two tribes, the Jahalin and the Ka'abne, uh, were moved here to the West Bank in, uh, in the Khan al-Ahmar area, as you may be uh, heard in the news today. And only uh, uh, 11,000 people out of the 90,000 people remained, survived the Nakba, the disaster. Those people, the country, the, the state of Israel, relocated them into this area, which we call the Siyaj area. The Siyaj area is the reservation area or the fence area, which is only 10% of the, of, the, of the Negev land, of the Negev area. 10%, about 10% of our population, but 10% of the land, which uh, sound for me uh, good, but uh, the end is not good because the country continues with the, with, the, with the same policy of taking over more and more Bedouin lands, and this is minimized. Now we are talking about 10%. So here is a, 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 like a, an official report of uh, a, the Secretary of State of uh, Colonies uh, with, uh, with the Churchill. Uh, that uh, promises the, the Bedouin community, the Bedouin people, that sheikhs of the tribes that he met here in Bir Saba in 1921, that they will keep their rights, their rights and their culture and their traditions, that they will not be interfered. Uh, here is uh, the Izor uh, Hasaig in Hebrew, which we say, or uh, the Siyaj area, this area, we just uh, we just zoom in into this area, and as you can see, uh, this is the ten percent. If you remember, as we said in few minutes ago, <clears throat> and here is the uh, seven townships. As you can see them, the 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 red ones here, we can see the government built those seven towns, and they always mean to uh, uh, concentrate all the Bedouin community into those seven. The Bedouin uh, rejected this, this plan, as you may know, and not, not all of them live into these seven towns. Only uh, uh, about half of them live into these seven, and the other live in unrecognized villages. Where are those villages? If you see, those are the blue, the, those are the, the red or the purple, dots here as you can see them and we have some squares those are the newly recognized ones but uh, about half of our population live in those unrecognized villages as you can see and if you wonder where where i am now this is the asera village this is my village here it is near Seifa at near arad and here should be the dead sea in the in the end here of the road so and the big city here of Beersheva is here, is here. So if you look at the map uh, later in your uh, free time, you can see what are we talking about. So we have seven towns that the government concentrated. Most of the people that they are IDPs, internally displaced in 1948 and uh, the few years that followed that. And even later in the, in the 1980s, people here, after the peace agreement with Egypt, they built a huge airport here. You can see the airplane. And uh, they, they moved most of them to Ksaifa and Arara, that newly established, relatively new, 1980s, was new later. The, the Bedouin towns started, the urbanization process of the Bedouin started in the 1969, 
by uh, establishing uh, Tel Sheva. This is the, the first one. Then later Rahat and uh, later Ksefa and Arara and Segev Shalom. And the, the latest were uh, in the 90s, the middle of the 90s was Lakia and Hora. So this is the, the, the issue of the uh, Bedouin uh, towns and villages in general, as you can see. Later we have this plan which is called the proper plan. As you can see, all the villages with the X's here, uh, are the villages that uh, the, the, the proper plan proposes, uh, this plan was uh, issued in the, uh, 2013, and the government uh, really planned to, to destroy most of the unrecognized villages and move the people to the, to the recognized ones. Uh, uh, the, the Bedouin uh, protested and uh, demonstrated this uh, plan, and it was uh, and it was frozen uh, and shelved. Uh, and also, the European Union uh, rejected the plan and asked the Israeli government to open uh, into um, direct negotiation uh, with the with the Bedouin community, and and that's what happened. So it was frozen, even that it passed the, the, the first reading in the Knesset, in the Israeli parliament. So it could be really affirmed, which is very, very sad and bad, unfortunately. Here is uh, uh, the people of Al-Araqib. Al-Araqib was, was, uh, was erased in, nine, in, in 2007 uh, at five o'clock in the morning. Those trees, you can see some of the trees. Here is an olive tree. You can see the olive tree here that was erased, uh, was destroyed and uh, uprooted. And the JNF, we are talking about the JNF, uh, came and planted in new trees, the JNF trees. We call them the JNF trees, <laughs> especially trees that more valuable than the Bedouin olive tree. And here you can see the, even the, the food of the, their animals was uh, was born in this uh, in this attack, where all the the, the houses of Al Arakib were destroyed. You know, since that time, Al Arakib was demolished was demolished more than 150 times up to now. Uh, here is uh, Sheikh Sayyah, as you can see, his tent here. He have no more houses, so he built his tent there. He live in the middle of the cemetery. You can see the graveyard here, the graves, and here. And here you can see Sheikh Sayyah here. And he, as he always says, this is the only place in the world that dead people are protecting alive ones. Uh, I would never uh, forget that. He always said that. And uh, here is the new trees of the JNF, as you can see. Here is a new planting uh, in Al Arakib, in Al Arakib, our station. And if you notice here, I don't know if you see the sign very well, mm -hmm. it says the ambassador's forest. And unfortunately, <laughs> uh, many of the European ambassadors uh, uh, fell into this mistake and was convinced that the JNF is really making the desert bloom, not uprooting Bedouins from their land and, uh, and the planting in new trees. So they supported that and, uh, and they named it uh, the ambassador force to honor the, um, the European ambassadors. <laughs> That's really funny. I don't know, ridiculous maybe. <laughs> Um, this is here again, as you can see him, he is uh, accompanied by um, attorney Shahda Ibn Barri to the court. He was taken to the court and here is more and more protest, but he is always on the horse again. As you can see him in the course here, <laughs> he never, never gave up. Sheikh Sayyah, Sheikh Sayyah is the, is the Sheikh of al Araki, the, the leader of al Araki. Al Arakib is not the only one. Here is the story of Amm al Hiran. Amm al Hiran, maybe you hear a lot about Amm al Hiran. Amm al Hiran was, uh, they demolished a lot of the houses, more than half of the houses of uh, Amm al Hiran. And Atir, Atir is the twin village they, because they, they, they have the same tribes. It is Abu al Qian tribe. 
and also more many of their houses were demolished why to make more space uh, to the new jewish orthodox town which will be established there and it will be called not more than hiran instead of um al hiran it would be hiran you know in arabic um is mother and when we say um al hiran is the mother of hiran hiran is the baby camels is the mother of the baby camels it was famous uh, of that in the past and uh, as, uh, so now they are going to drop the Om and uh, build the Hiran. And I, I, I always say, in my uh, ironic way, they, they are going to kill their mom, <laughs> to kill the Om, <laughs> kill their mom. <laughs> so this is also, uh, you can see the forest and the background here. Here is uh, Om al-Hiran. And uh, and Atir, no, this no, this is Atir. Atir and Amal Hiran are twins, so sometimes I even confuse between them. And as you can see, the forest it is the large, the largest forest in the Middle East. We have like twenty-eight million million trees, and now also they are uh, threatened um, by being uh, uprooted and to, to make more space for the. Uh, 30 or 29 or 30 million trees to, to expand the forest. Uh, even that, they, this is really, you know, they, they, they are keeping and, uh, and the tracking the, the, the forest there and helping the JNF and, and they will be uprooted also. Nobody is protecting, nobody uh, have any immunity. Here is Atir and Amal Hiran, and here is the plan. This is Atir and this is Amal Hiran. They are very close to the West Bank. The West Bank is here in the end of this road. Of this is a small road, this sub road here, road 316. And uh, Atir and Amal Hiran have the plan to uproot them also. And here is the, the detailed plan, as you can see here. Uh, Amal Hiran again, and Amal Hiran again. And I'm now taking you to my village, Asera. Asera. You see, there is no signs on the entrance of the villages. No signs. Uh, they, they have no names. They, no one wants to have their names. And uh, of course, no signs. And they, ha they don't appear in any official maps. But we tried to break all that. And we put our sign, as you can see, the entrance of the village. Here you can see our sign, Asera, and in three languages, Arabic, Hebrew, and English. And also there is a line here in Hebrew, which says established in the Ottoman period. Yeah. And here you can see the sign. This is a special sign. It's a special warning that you will never see in the road. Well, those are demolishing houses here. <laughs> uh, uh, here is the deed of my, uh, of my great grandfather buying this piece of land. And you can see it was in nine, uh, 23, of November 1921, in the in the British period, in the British mandate period, and you can see here the British stamps on it. But Israel don't recognize this. this they say Bedouin uh, uh, bought uh, this piece of land from another Bedouin, and you don't have the title, and it, 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 you have to. We have to confiscate this piece of land also. Here's our car, and this is my house, and this is me on the stairs here of the house. You can see this is my wife, Sapna, making our bread, and this is our uh, little uh, troublemaker, Muhammad. <laughs> also. And, and if you wonder what these unrecognized villages mean, it, uh, simply we will say it is no addresses, living in, in, a, in a place of demolition always, uh, no right to vote to uh, local um, uh, councils. We don't have local councils. We only participate, some of us participate in the, in the local, in the, um, uh, in the general elections because it is not accessible. So many people don't even vote. And, no public transportation. Uh, we pay all the taxes, but we have very, very minimum services. High rates of uh, mortality, uh, infant mortality, 
and very few kindergartens, no running water, no electricity, no daycares, no ownership of the land. A very long list of no's. But there is one yes, you can see it here. The bulldozer, we have always the bulldozer. Demolishing houses is one of the families that demolished their houses. The kids came back from the school and they found their house uh, destroyed just because they are between the, there is no any uh, other reason. And here, uh, another bulldo uh, bulldozer that's not demolishing houses, they are blowing the fields, they are destroying the fields, the, the Bedouin fields, because the, 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 the government don't recognize their ownership. So even if they plant some, uh, uh, some wheat or barley for their animals, they come and plow it, as they can see it. Um, if those ways is not enough for taking more and more lands, it is the military can declare an area as a military area, and it's done. You can see you can see the fences around, and it's way to take more and more land. The other issue is the water supply and their prices. If you wonder what are these pipes, this is not for one family. This is for the whole village. This pipe, this tiny pipe of one inch, in the best case, sometimes it's half an inch like this one. So some families don't have water only in the night, some drops in the night, and some have very few, and their prices are very high also. This is a bad picture, but I can exp I, I will try to explain it. You see that the, the fence here, the, the concrete fence here around, it, uh, it, it, it just limits or block the families around here to, uh, from accessing the main road here. In case of emergency, they cannot access the road and come to the hospital or to the emergency cases or anything. Uh, here are those guys, you know, uh, uh, glowing the, the, the warning and the demolition orders. Uh, and they have many files, as you can see in their hand, uh, into, my, uh, into the houses of my village. This is my house. They, 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 uh, they posted it in, uh, in 2006. Here they are moving from one place to another, uh, protected by policemen and so on. So nobody even can ask them anything. So what we do, as you can see, we are protesting everywhere, demonstrating in Beersheba, in Jerusalem here. Uh, even Muhammad grew a bit and he now demonstrating with me, as you can see, and he says, I am invisible. That's why you don't want to see me. You don't want to see me because I am invisible. And the stop brother. And if you remember brother, we stopped the brother finally, and it was frozen. Here is our tent as we protested the JNF and the, the, the Israeli policy in Jerusalem. We, we stayed there, our prayer representatives, and I was one of them. We stayed one week in, in front of the Knesset of the Israeli parliament a few years ago. Here we are talking to the media. Is my friend Ibrahim Abu Afash talking to, uh, the, to, to, to parliament and ministers and politicians? And here I'm uh, meeting the, uh, Professor James Anaya the special rapporteur for indigenous people rights. And here is Mr. Walter Hafner, the previous uh, ambassador of um, Switzerland in Israel, and giving them the sign of the village also as a gift. And here is a group of, of uh, uh, supporters that uh, are having their, expressing their solidarity from Belgium with the Bedouin community and we arrange a, a, a long march of biking and hiking between the villages, between all the Bedouin unrecognized villages. It was really very successful a few years ago. Uh, we are strengthening our community. As you can see, we are building the, the mosques and the, uh, laying the pipes of the water to the village, uh, connecting the, the, the the village to uh, to the power by uh, generators and now we have the solar panels and this bulldozer this is the only uh, friendly bulldozer that 
is not really demolishing houses, it is coming to, uh, to pave the road to the village. It is a dirt road to the village. And here is me and my solar panels on the roof. And more than that, we go to the Israeli court, even that we really don't believe that this will, 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 will help us in our struggle. We partner with other uh, human rights and civil NGOs, and uh, we create alternative plans and we representing them to the government and to the uh, decision makers. And uh, we come to, to forms and uh, organizations and uh, really inform the people. And if you wonder how can you help us, if you can make this uh, issue known to your friends and uh, community, uh, you can bring uh, 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 it to really, and you can visit us always, not in Corona times, after the Corona, we are waiting for you always. And uh, you can join our uh, really mailing list. We have many groups with this. And uh, I want to stop here and thank you very much for your time and uh, we will be ready to, uh, to answer your questions. And if we have time, maybe we can, uh, we can share our video that my uh, daughter uh, sent to me. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Halil, that was a, 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 fantastic, um, a fantastic presentation. And I have to say, you tend to think that you know a lot about what the state of Israel is doing and then you meet somebody like you, turn the page and there's a new fresh lot of information that, that comes across and, and that, was just a, that was just a fantastic presentation. Um, Halil, can I just, before I, before I go on to the questions, can I just present to you something that the JNF UK says about its work in the NACAB? And I'd really, I'd really like to get your, um, I'd really like to get your response um, to it. On its website, the JNF UK says that it's working a lot in the NACAB, and that the that the NACAB is quote a politically uncomplicated area. Philanthropic focus on the Negev would not engage matters of political controversy. And it goes on to say, we are turning the Negev green and enriching the quality of life of its communities. It says communities, plural, meaning more than one community. So I just want you to say how you see this claim that the JNF UK is making about your life and the Bedouin of the, the, Bedouin of the NACAB's life. Oh my God, <laughs> oh my God. If, if it wasn't really sad, sad it should be funny. <laughs> um, it's, it's just ridiculous to see what JNF doing. This JNF is really involved in political issues and their decisions are made and mainly uh, targeting one group which is uh, the, the the benefit of the of the Jewish community? We are not even in the in the margins of their plans. We are not in their line. We are in the opposite side totally. What they are doing is minimizing the space, taking more and more and more Bedouin land, and finding very creative creative ways to take more and more Bedouin lands. They are not natural. They are not neutral. They are really uh, in, uh, serving the, the, the Zionist uh, agenda. Unfortunately, they, they cannot say that. This is totally not true. Never was mm. true, so even. Mm. Yeah. And um, can I just ask you as well, um, Halil? Yes, of course. The, the plans of the, that the state has for the NACAB, you've described how your people have been reduced and reduced in space. There's a big drive now to move people into all these towns. I mean, I read somewhere that there was a plan to establish 
refugee displacement camps in the Nakab and to sweep people towards the seven existing towns. Can you say something about what the towns are like and what you see as the ultimate plan of the state for your people? Yes, um, this is a plan that uh, they say that it is a temporary uh, camp for those families that they are going to uh, to take over their lands uh, in the benefit of um, expanding the road, the main road, which is the highway toll road. Uh, it's road six that come from the north. And now it, it, it reached nearby Beersheba, eastern to Beersheba. It is supposed to continue uh, to the Negev, to the Nakab. And now they, 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 they went to, uh, to uh, confiscate their lands. And uh, all the families that, um, you know, are located into this area of the, of the same line of the, uh, of the road, will be taken to this uh, like refugee camp that they are going to establish um, a lot of organization human rights organization and ngos are uh, protesting that and uh, really uh, negating that and, and and we are against that all all the people here are against that and we hope that they will uh, will stop and withdraw this plan it's very very bad Mm. And of course, the really bizarre thing about that plan is they're talking about refugees, but they're talking about their own citizens. It's very strange for a state to label its own citizens as refugees, isn't it? That's something that I've never heard of before. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Uh, yeah. Really sad and bad and... Uh, it's, it's a, a, we see that as a way of, of really ethnic cleansing, taking the people from their land and putting them as refugees into their land, into their homeland, where they, established, where they were established all the time, where they were born. We are talking about indigenous people. We, yes. <laughs> the situation is really horrible. I'm, I'm really, I feel really afraid. Yes, yes. And, and so many people here. Yes, I mean, um, Abe, one of our one of the people in the audience, is pointing out that depriving the Bedouins of their means to exist sounds very much like um, a genocide, an attempted genocide. Yes, yes, we see that as, as, as really as a crime, and we hope that uh, new leadership in Israel will come and stop this this disaster. Really, mm -hmm. it's a disaster, mm -hmm. uh, and we, uh, we we don't see the end. We don't see that the light and the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. I hope mm -hmm. that one day we will see a new plan that really cooperating with the people and partnering with our community and leadership, and do something good for the benefit of all the people in the Nakam, mm -hmm. Jews and Bedouins, at the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, he also wonders if this is something that has been put before the International Criminal Court, the ICC, in their in their consideration for their consideration. Uh, I I don't believe that it will work, you know, because we are not a, a, a second part. We are the same part. We are as Israeli citizens, unfortunately. We are not the 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 the, the, the Palestinian people under the occupation that can go because they they can be declared as a state uh, we are not we are israeli citizens we are the same state and they can always say that the, the, the court is open come to the israeli court where is the justice mm. there is a question about the israeli um, courts um halil and that is how important do you see the work of a dollar supporting bedouin um, communities and can you give us a couple of examples of the kind of uh, success and difficulties that Adullah has had in advancing the, the Bedouin case? Yes, Adullah and uh, uh, Akri, the Association for uh, the Rights of uh, 
uh, Israeli citizens in general and uh, NCF, the negative coexistence form, I think very, very, are very, very important NGOs. Adala has very large number of cases that they took to the coast, uh, to the court, and they succeeded really to, 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 to make the change. They, we, uh, they opened, the government opened some schools in the unrecognized villages uh, due to the decision of the Israeli court after the case of Adala. They opened some clinics, mother and care uh, clinics in the unrecognized villages. And they stopped the demolitions and Asera, where I am standing now, sitting now and talking to you. This is the, the struggle of Adana the, the, with partnership to the, with the people of uh, Asera, and uh, we are so thankful for them, really. Mm. Mm. There's a lot of questions coming in, um, <laughs> uh, Halil, which is, which is fantastic. Um, one person is asking for a clarification of terminology. Uh, do Bedouin use the term Palestinian for yourself? How do you self? How do you self-identify? I identify myself as Palestinian. I am a Palestinian person, man, and I, uh, I live in Israel, and I am Israeli citizen. Also, there is no contradiction. I can't see that then contradiction between that. Being yeah. Palestinian and they are uh, there are many Palestinians who live in in the United Kingdom and uh, in Canada in the, in America and in Israel and in the uh, under the the, the the Palestinian Authority the PA mm. also. Mm. Halil, I'm going to roll up a couple of questions together. Um, there's a question about life in the state-built towns for Bedouins, what work is available, what health and education systems are provided by the state in the towns that the state wants you to go to. And there's another question here which is a very interesting one. Are the reports true that the authorities have used crop spraying aircraft to kill Bedouin crops in the Nakab? in an attempt to make people move into these towns. So first of all, what's it like in the towns? And secondly, are people's crops being destroyed by aircraft spraying chemicals? Yes, I will answer them. Um, in, the, uh, in the recognized towns, in the seven, remember the seven towns? Mm -hmm. um, the government uh, uh, supply services, they provide those services of uh, health and schools and kindergartens. And uh, I think they are good. Uh, we cannot com compare them totally to the uh, neighboring Jewish ones, but they are, I think they are good, very good. Uh, unfortunately, they also need to, uh, to provide this service to the neighboring unrecognized villages like us. And, uh, they are not always accessible and so the service is available but not accessible so we need women need to uh, to make their 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 uh, their pregnancy testing and take their kids to vaccination and uh, take the kids to the schools and all the families need transportation and it's not always available this is the hardest point of that so they are combined or uh, shared by the unrecognized and the recognized towns. This is the issue with the, with the, with the health services. Mm -hmm. Regarding your second question uh, of spraying crops from the air, uh, it happened in the past uh, with Al Arakib, and uh, due to the, 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 the case that was filed by, uh, by Adala, the, the government stopped doing that. And they moved to the to blowing the, the fields with, with with those tractors, as I show you in the in the slides. Mm. But it mm -hmm. happened. In the past. It it's happened. happened in the past, and um, but there's another form of destruction now, isn't there, in terms of tree planting? Yes, also with tree planting, uh, the people cannot uh, uh, plant new trees, and any uh, new trees can be uprooted by the government. Also, with the with the with the simple thing is with the seasonal uh, crops like uh, 
uh, barley and wheat, which is very, very simple. The government come, uh, come and blow those fields. They destroy them after they, they, they have already grown and, and became green. Mm. Yes, um, there's a question here from Eirig. Um, do you make any connections with Bedouin struggles in the South Hebron Hills and Jordan Valley, um, places that are facing similar evictions by the Israeli military? Do you have any connections with them? Uh, not really um, a very strong connection. We are trying to uh, collect sometimes some charity and help and food. Uh, especially by the Islamic movement, and uh, we we provide it to those families. We give it to the families there. Uh, this is the very very essential and very very small support that we can do at this moment. But uh, as you can uh, see, we are very very. Uh, um, I can say busy only. This is a very simple word. We are very. <laughs> we were over, you know, with the, with the troubles inside, with the home demolitions. We have 2,500 demolitions a year in the Nakab. Only in the Nakab, we have more than 2,000 demolitions a year. So uh, we are trying really, we are expressing our solidarity and uh, trying to, to help, but not always it's available really. Mm. And people are resisting those demolitions, aren't they? As for instance, in yes, as, you, as yeah. you've just described, yeah, yeah. Here we are resisting. They, they, they are resisting in the West Bank and the Jordan Valley, and yeah. they hear the story of uh, Al Khan Al Ahmar is also uh, always in the in the in the headlines, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, we hope that uh, really they will uh, give them finally the right to stay in their lands. Yes. They were moved several times. You know, originally uh, the people of the Jahalin tribe, the uh, uh, that live today in Khan Al Ahmar, and they are under under the threat. They were originally from here, from our area. They was moved twice up to now, and now it it will be the third time that they will be uprooted from their lands. Mm. Um, Halil. Um, you, you outlined the fact that um, you you don't you're not a, you're not allowed to get involved in local elections. Is that correct? Yes, we don't have local councils. So you have no control over your own uh, areas, your own towns, etc. Not yes. All what we are doing here is uh, voluntary work. Okay. We have a, a small committee that we have chosen uh, from our people here in the in the in the, in the village, and those five people uh, working around the, the the clock, as we say, uh, mm -hmm. 24 hours, and meeting mm -hmm. sometimes to uh, try to provide the basic services like water, like. Uh, uh, solar panels for the, the, the needed families and uh, 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 secure um, transportation for the kids here to the schools and the and the next uh, in the neighboring town and so mm -hmm. on, which mm -hmm. is really very hard, not easy. Mm -hmm. right. So really, what you're telling us is you have no right to uh, to organize with for yourselves you haven't got local representation the services that the state should be providing and that the state provides anywhere else you provide them yourselves for your own community down to putting up a sign that indicates your own township you haven't even got the sign that's provided there you do have the right to vote in the national elections and that's often that's often quoted as uh, by Israel to to say that it's a democratic um, society, which you know we 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 you've you've obviously disproved that. But uh, there's a question about how you feel about the recent um, election results in Israel. Do they make your concerns for the future worse? Wow. Um... Very hard question. I really cannot uh, say if I feel bitter or not. But uh, um, 
I am optimistic always, and that what uh, really uh, keep me up up to now, uh, and continue the struggle with my friends here. Uh, I hope I hope really uh, uh, up to now uh, during the 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 twenty uh, years the past twenty years we have very uh, discriminatory uh, government that always. Uh, uh, that was always against Arabs, and they didn't uh, really um, uh, the, uh, give the legitimacy uh, for the, the, the Arab uh, parts, the, the joint list, or the others to join the government. And now uh, we hear new voices with the, uh, with the Islamic uh, party. Uh, they have four... Uh, Parliament members and the joint list have uh, six members, so together they have ten. We hope that uh, this this year, this time, they change the Netanyahu regime and uh, form a new coalition, maybe uh, that give us more rights and more equality. Mm. We just hope. I, I, we, we, I don't have any any basis that I I can relay on them. This is just my my feeling up to now. That's just your hope, yeah. That's yes. just your hope, yeah. And um, there's a question from Kathy, who's interested in knowing whether within the seven government towns there are local elections. Yes, yes, they have local uh, councils, and they and they have free elections every five years, and they can choose their uh, their uh, community leadership and uh, the community members and. Uh, the mayors also. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So it's really the people in the unrecognized villages that are being massively discriminated against in terms of electoral representation. You're having to do everything for yourselves. Definitely, yes. Yeah. We need to do that by ourselves. Yeah. Um, Halil, um, looking at the, the picture that you've presented to us, is one where the Bedouin are being increasingly confined and constricted. There seems to be an ultimate plan to urbanize a community that before 1948 was a self-sufficient community in the Nakab, living harmoniously on the land, um, producing its own food, uh, having its own herds, etc. It's very distinctive and very traditional way of life. You've got the title deeds for your land uh, going all that all that way back. Um, I've, I've seen a quotation from Moshe Diane suggesting that the state wants to urbanize the um, Bedouin and to create a kind of urban working class concentrated in towns, um, maybe as a pool of cheap labor to put it at its, to put it at its um, bluntest. And I think he has actually said that by these moves, the phenomenon of the Bedouin will disappear. Do you think that this is the, the goal to transform the traditional way of life of the Bedouin that was so proud and self-sufficient into a pool of urban poor. Definitely, yes. I have no doubt that this is the the, the main target to uh, to end the Bedouin life, the Bedouin traditions, and move those people to the towns. The urbanization is not really in the benefit of the Bedouin community. We we can prove that because those seven towns are the the the, the poorest are the highest, have the highest rates of unemployment, are in the, in the lowest social economic scale, they are in, 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 uh, in cluster one of 10, which is mm -hmm. very, very sad and bad. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they, 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 they don't have uh, a good infrastructures, not, don't have good uh, education system. Uh, the, all, all the, 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 the characters of those uh, towns. I'm talking about the towns, not talking about the unrecognized villages, which is a, a very sad story. But even the, those recognized towns that they, 
trying to represent it to the Europeans and to us sometimes as the paradise. It is the hell. It's not the paradise because the people are suffering there. They are killing each other. A lot of violence between the people because they feel stressed there. No, no place to develop, no place to work. Everybody, they, they are just staying there, staying there in the night. And in the morning, they have to look for the, 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 the works in the Dead Sea or in the big cities around. So, they, or the good solution that we, we hope for. Mm. So, mm. so I mean, that's it, why I, I don't like it. I don't we are bit like them. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think the picture is extremely clear that that you've given us, and and one can't help comparing what's happening to the Bedouin, to the fate of the First Nation Americans, or to what happened to Aboriginal people in Australia, whose way of life has been. Um, undermined and destroyed through this uh, through this um, through this process. I, I wonder if I can ask you to look now at something else, and that is the Nakab has been stolen from the Bedouin. It's been converted into state land. Your people have been constricted and constrained into ever smaller into ever smaller areas, and that leaves a great expanse of land for which the state has other plans um, and the JNF is involved in some of those plans. So one of our team, uh, Greg Dropkin, has um, researched the militarisation of the Nakab and we know that when the state moves the Bedouin people on it says it's to encourage economic development and um, military development. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the state wants to put in place of the Bedouin? What are its plans, its development plans for the Nakab? There is nothing clear really because first of all we are not part of the planning system. Uh, everything is, is, is like secrets as I will always say. Everything here as the Dimona nuclear center. So we are not part of anything. So all the time, uh, most of the decisions coming from up to down. Yes. So we are dictated by the government. So if we were part of the, the, the planning process, we, we, we could really say what we think and, and really contribute for this dialogue and, uh, and produce better solutions for all, for all sides, for the benefits of all the people in the region. But we are not part of that. So the Israeli government brought most money of the of the training basis of the of the of the army to the to the south, yeah, and and they they hope that uh, this will will bring more and more families and develop the area. But really, we couldn't see that the area is prospering and uh, and being developed and many people coming. This is not the case most of the people want to stay in the north and in the center and mm. very few people uh, move to the south so you know, it's only 10 percent as i mentioned before okay so their plans are to move 1.5 million um jewish israelis to the uh, nakab that's what they want to do but what you're saying is that it's not it's not being as successful as they want is that right Halil? Yes, it's not so successful as I as I see it, uh, at least. As you see it, yeah. But these military bases are being developed there, is that correct? Yes, they moved some of the military bases to the Negev. Yeah, yeah. And for people watching, it's well worth um, reading Greg's article and seeing how many pre-military training academies the JNF UK is investing in. Um, uh, training people to join the IDF and uh, the involvement of Unit 8200 that's caused a bit of scandal over here recently because of the appointment of a graduate of 8200 to a high position in the in the Labour in the Labour Party. Yeah, good. Let's just have a look and see. I think there are some more questions coming in. Um, Magdalena is interested in how access to water 
is being used by the government as a tool to displace communities. And another person, Mike, is saying that when he saw the town to which Bedouin were being sent, he saw a metal walled house which would be hot in summer and cold in winter. So it's really asking about quality of housing and access to water. Oh my God, this is a very hard <laughs> question and a hard situation. Not hard to answer, of course. Um, you know, many, many, many families still live in, in thin houses and uh, at least with thin roofs. And those, as you can imagine, they are very hot in the summer and they are very cold in the winter. And uh, the, the access to water is still limited in many, many villages. And uh, I, I remember uh, at least at the last few years, uh, some families bring the water in, um, in tankers to the village. And they pay, I think, four times the money that we pay for the same one cube meter for uh, the same water. Because even not the same, the water is more dangerous there because they have some, some stain and, 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 and diseases and microbes. microbes. It's very, very sad. And uh, I, I have no doubt that the government used that to pressure the people. Not only this, the access to school, the access to clinics, even the, the, the taxes discounts that they give to those people. There is, uh, are some tax exemptions that they give to the people in the unrecognized, in the, uh, in the villages, not in the unrecognized, in the, in, the, uh, in the towns, the Jewish towns and the villages in the, in the, uh, in the Negev. They, they deprive the people, the, the unrecognized villages, cities, uh, c uh, people, citizens from the, those exemptions. So it's a way to pressure the people to move to the towns. Mm. Mm. But we want to move Yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm just conscious of the time, Halil, and I would like to say that if people want to get an impression of the misleading information that the JNF is putting out, I wouldn't want to show it on our platform, but there are videos that they show about the Nakab, which are a million miles away from the reality that Halil has given us uh, today. And if I can just scroll back to what we said at the beginning, these, these are accounts of inhumane acts, systematic oppression and domination of the of the Bedouin, which they are resisting. And um, I think you, Halil, are a splendid instance of the different forms of resistance that are being practiced. And as is uh, Sheikh al Saya. and there is a question, the last question I think I'll take before we ask to see your daughter's uh, film. Um, that resistance that people are putting up, what, what is the current situation in Umm al-Hiran and al-Arakib? Is, is, is the Sheikh still living in the cemetery? What's, what's happening? Sheikh Sayyah is still living in the cemetery with his uh, son Aziz and uh, very few families that remain there uh, with their kids in the cemetery. And he is still rebuilding every time the house or the tent uh, where he lived after every demolition. And he is still counting the demolitions again and again and again. He is a resilient and very, very uh, courageous person. I really admire him. Uh, regarding Umm al-Hiran, uh, the situation is really very bad after the last uh, mass demolition that uh, was uh, about three years ago. They, uh, they just forced the people to, to sign that they uh, agree to move to the neighboring town, Hora. And uh, in, in, in a few years, they still have troubles with the government because they didn't really locate it uh, or allocate uh, uh, plots for the families to build their new houses there. And uh, it's a question of time. I think a uh, few months or a year or a half or less or more uh, till the, this village will, be, will disappear totally from the map and from the, the horizon.
Mm. Well, Halil, I want to say a big thank you for, for all of that. You've given us so such a rich presentation and such fantastic examples of the strength and resilience of the of the of the Bedouin people and given us lots of weapons for us to use against the JNF in our own country and their incredible lies not to put too fine a point on it about the work that they're doing in the in the NACAB and it's no wonder Halil that you have been a representative of the Bedouin because I think the way you've presented the issues today is so clear and so compelling and I think we all feel a great debt of gratitude uh, to you and hope that this will be the beginning of an ongoing partnership with you and I just wonder now if I might ask you to share your daughter's film um, uh, to, to finish off. Oh I think yeah, that's so kind of you. Uh, I will try soon to share my presentation, my screen. Yes. Ah, here we are. Here we are. She made it very quickly to show you the village. Uh, <laughs> very, very quickly. Alcira, yes. Alcira, yes. It's silent. No voice. That's fine. These are some of our guests' cars here and our car. And uh, here you will see we have also uh, a guest house uh, where we can uh, host some people. This is our tent, as you can see. This is our garden. <laughs> oh, I will ask here to make it slowly next time. This is the tent. And this is the corner where I'm sitting now. Where oh, you can see the desk here. And here is the, our rooms. We have two rooms here and two rooms in another place. And the tent. This is our fuel lamp. Yes, here is slowly. It's okay. <laughs> See. Oh, you still have a uh, half minute, it's okay. It's good. Yeah, it's very good, it's yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So even we are in unrecognized village and have all the limits, we have uh, a hosting place here a place where we host guests and we were uh, fully booked at the Passover days here the, uh, the old last, uh, last week or the passing week now. Well it looks really it really looks lovely and one of our um, one of the people watching Angela is a filmmaker and she's just uh, said that it's important that we archive this film so please tell that we're very grateful to her for that. It looks yeah. lovely. It looks lovely, Halina. I'm yeah, sure you've encouraged. And we're sorry for the, the low quality. No, no, no. That was uh, that was a lovely way to end. Actually, a lovely way to end. And you never know. Some of us one day, inshallah, will 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 visit. Um, so once more, Halil, can I just say a huge thank you um, for this? and we look forward to working with you again in the future. Thank you very, very much indeed. And if I may, I'll very just make... It's, it's, our, it's our privilege and our pleasure. And it's our privilege and pleasure. I've just got two short announcements to make. Um, the first relates to um, East Jerusalem, and we've been following the progress of uh, the Summerin family, and on April the 5th, they will be facing the Supreme Court to decide the fate of their family home, which the JNF has had a hand in seizing and handing over to the radical settler group, Elad. Now, obviously, we're not just interested in the Summerin family, because we know that in Al Bustan and Sheikh Jarrah, many, many other families are facing eviction and demolition. This is 
um, this, this family is a representative of a far wider problem that, that Halil has also illustrated in the, in the NACAB. So please look out for notifications about the fate of the Sumerian family. And please tune in next week on um, April the 10th to hear another Stop the JNF webinar. And we're very pleased to be able to welcome Eric Adder. Um, Eric is a former Dutch uh, diplomat, the son of a Christian, pas a Christian pastor who was instrumental in the Second World War in saving many Jewish people's lives, um, a great person and who the JNF chose to commemorate by planting trees over an ethnically Kenyan's village. And Eric was so outraged by that action that he took um, action of his own uh, against it to say that it was, it was inappropriate in the name of his father to uh, plant trees on, on um, an ethnically cleansed yeah. village. So that will be another fantastic um, webinar. Next Saturday at this slightly earlier time of three o'clock, so please tune into that. So I think it's time for us to go. So Halil, I'll say thank you once more and uh, goodbye to you. I'll see you again, I hope. And yeah. goodbye to everybody who's been watching and learning from that webinar. Thank you all very much. Thank you.